Good morning. I'm so excited today to introduce you to my friend, Andre Miller. I first uh, met Andre at a conference where I was speaking, and she said she wanted to meet me, and I happened to be near her hometown, I think. And she walked in, and it was so sweet to find a fellow blogger, because we met online, I guess, and uh, in person. You know, uh, we bloggers, we have lots of friends that we've never met and that we won't meet. But what a thrill to know someone in California who blogs, a Christian blogger, and she is delightful and has um, uh, written a few books. And she is also a great speaker. So, um, and originally from Jamaica, is that right? I'm originally from the Bahamas. Oh, Bahamas. So My sorry. husband is from Jamaica. I see. My parents are from Barbados. Okay. Yay, all of that. So I'm an island girl. <laughs> I love it. Andre, tell me a little bit about your family and your background and then how you got into ministry. Okay, here goes. So my name is Andrew Miller. However, um, on these here internets, you'll see me under another name, Nilsi Isak, because that's the name I started blogging under. I blog over at lifenotesencouragement.com. And I started blogging because um, I, after my brother died, it was the first time in our family we had experienced the loss. Hmm. Um, and everyone, I come from a large family, and everyone was dealing with it differently. And I found that when I wrote, it was cathartic, it was healing. Mm -hmm. And I just started the blog on a whim. Um, amazingly enough, people were reading what I was writing. <laughs> and um, in a short period of time for me, not that I'm ever over his death, but I wasn't grieving so deeply. And I said, you know, the common theme here is that um, the Lord has encouraged me as I write. Mm. And if this is encouraging to others, I want to keep writing in that vein. And so that's really how I started blogging. Um, I'm a Christian wife and mother. I got saved when I was eight, but I really came to know the Lord when I was maybe 15. Uh, my story is very, very boring. I never backslid um, in the conventional sense of the word. I didn't have a wild time or, and decided, you know, Jesus was real. He was always real to me, um, but so I never backslid or anything like that. Um, it's just that at 15, it became eye open in what this was that I was a part of, and mm. that's how I wanted to live my life. Do you um, think that's because, uh, sorry to interrupt here, because that happened the same with me. I was saved at eight, at 15, more real. Do you think it's because of just a natural maturation of growing up that God, be, you become more aware of committing your life to God or? Or can you have any thoughts on that? I, I, I think so, because at eight, at eight, I don't know what I know. <laughs> but I knew that I wanted, and it wasn't a fair-based thing. I wasn't doing this to please my parents or anything like that. I, and for me, I, I think I was, I was on the choir, and I was singing It Is Well With My Soul. And somehow that day, those words pierced me, like, is it well with my soul? And I, could re and I started to cry, and I was like, it is well because of what he's done for me. Um, I, I remember that and I was like, and I didn't go to a very emotional church or, you know, lots of hoopla, anything. So everybody noticed that I was crying. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. It's well, it's well. And how old were you when your brother died? Um, Approximately. It was about 10 years ago. So I was okay. about in my 40s. I was in my 40s. Was it a shock? Was it a shock that he was going so to die? You no, know, he had um, he has scleroderma. The the shock was the initial when he first got the diagnosis because my brother was like Mister, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, mm. big and muscular and buff and everything, and always took care of himself. And he got married, and we we never know how he contracted this autoimmune illness, but it was a progressive chain of events. Eventually got a diagnosis. He moved to Florida and he'd been living with it for a long time. He lived with it much longer than anyone anticipated because usually you don't live that long with it. It's connective tissue disorder. Eventually everything fails. And that's what happens. It's hard and his lungs fail. Hmm. And so when he died, I was, ex I'm never expecting death, but it was imminent in his case. And so when he called that last time, I kind of, I don't know why I knew, I knew that this was it. Hmm. I knew that this was it because it just sounded different and everything. And I had gotten a chance to see him 
I think either a couple of months, I, I had seen him before he died on just on a vacation or whatever. And I got a chance to talk with him and so forth and so on. Um, so I, 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 I was at peace with whatever was going to happen. The, the sad part is I think it was hard for my mother. I mean, a child dies before her. And I think it was sad for, harder for some other parts of my family because it's like they didn't, they fought it. They didn't expect. Hmm. His death was so hard for them. I don't really know why. I, and I, I, what I do is respect everyone's grieving process, but some of it, some of the ugliness that came out of the grief was hard to, 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 to stomach because it's mm-hmm. like, ultimately, if we're all believers and you believe that God controls life and death, who, who are you mad at? Who are you angry with? But I get mm-hmm. that you have to process your feelings. So you have to let people process you know, process. and your writing, it sounds like your writing was a great healer for you as well. It as was a great healer for me. It was mm-hmm. a great, he- my, my writing was a healer for me. I realized that I can get my, I feel like I sometimes express my emotions better on paper than um, verbally. I guess it depends on what's happening. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I, it was like <sighs> a lot of personalities in my family. I have always been the one that kind of like, I'm the middle child and I don't fight for attention and I was okay with that. Um, But I just didn't feel like my voice was being heard anyhow. Not that, that wasn't the point, but I just wanted to get these these feelings out. And Mm -hmm. so it was best to just get them out (laughs) on paper because they were better received on paper than um, with people, the people in, in, you know, um, in in my family. My husband was trying to understand, but he comes from a family of, it's him and his brother. And um, I don't know, he's not, not lost a sibling. He's very supportive, but it just was, he was doing the best he could. But it, to me, I, was, I needed just to get all of, those, all of those thoughts. And how long have you been blogging? You know what year you started? Okay, so this is year number 10. Okay, well, I'm glad we're wow. celebrating. And I, don't what- even, I don't even celebrate the <laughs> blogiversary anymore. <laughs> the blogiversary. I think I, st- I think I started in 2008, but I only did it like once a month and wondered why no one was reading. I didn't really understand the whole concept. I don't but think that- a lot of us did when we started. No, I mean, no. we were just writing. I mean, mm-hmm. blogging in the old days, was some of it was nicer too. But- yeah, yeah, so true. Well, we're talking today about making our lives count. And I know you are a woman of the word. You always go to the word first and you've encouraged me. Sometimes I just say, I think I need to talk to Andre about this. And I call you and you usually pick up or now we're doing Marco Polo, which is fun. But um, what legacy uh, overall do you want to pass down to those who know and love you? All right. So, uh, you know, I didn't get to say this, but I'm going to answer. It's me and my husband and I have four children. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. Um, And and grandchildren. And I have one one granddaughter (laughs) who I I see via FaceTime all the time. (laughs) Wonderful. Um, and one of the things, both when I, my husband is saved, we, we, you know, we were saved and we got married. And one of the things for us was, you know, we want to pass down a legacy of faith. And so it's always been, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hmm. Um, it's a sign on the door as you enter the house. And it's what we've always um, wanted. We've always been on the same page with this. But, you know, so that's our desire, but the living it out. You know, well, that's the challenge, obviously. That's the challenge. Um, And I think for us, for me, since you're interviewing me, we have both, what we've learned over the years is to be authentic, Mm -hmm. to be authentic and open with our faith to our children, really to anyone. So, you know, I don't hide my anger. I don't hide my confusion. I don't hide my doubt. I don't only show the pretty side of being a Christian because I don't know what that is. There's no pretty side to being a Christian. Uh, <laughs> um, they get all of me. They see me wrestling with things. They hear my thoughts um, so that they can understand that this is also normal. You know, if there's doubt, if there's anything, there's an acknowledgement. They see us praying. We, we, we pray together. They see us seeking and searching and going into the word. What does the Bible say? You know, they see us wrestling and trying to figure things out. Um, I, I, I feel like that has been the biggest difference because... The biggest difference of what? 
that's to me that's made the impact because it wasn't like a pretense it wasn't like this is the best way to go and i'm pretending and i have all the answers it was mm -hmm. really like you don't god don't need help for you to try and get his children to come and follow him <laughs> You be you. You be who he's called mm -hmm. you to be. You, uh, Christ in you will will work out. Will work with the people in your family. They're gonna see. They're gonna pick up. They're gonna hear. They're gonna know what they need to know. Um, we're always available as parents. I I just like to, I say it like that because my all of my children serve the Lord in different mm -hmm. capacities. They, they, this is their choice, though. They're Christians. They're Christians first and foremost. Yes, everybody's you know figuring out their lives and young adults and working and doing all of these things, but they're Christians. And so th that's the only thing I can say. I don't have a playbook. <laughs> you know, this is what you do. You must, I mean, we're mm -hmm. a Christian family, but I remember our struggle trying to have devotions every night. And it's like, this isn't working. This mm -hmm. isn't working. The kids are still awake. They're so tired. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've done that. Or, you know, everyone says you're supposed to pray. You're supposed to do all these things and we try. And it's like, yeah, it's not working. <laughs> it's not working but god you know our hearts you know what we're trying to do and we continually you know make the effort and just do it in a way that makes sense for us um that that's that's always with the bible as the foundation and being able to talk and to pray and to seek so yeah my uh, girlfriend was fond of reminding me that more is caught than taught. And so yes. what your children have caught is an authentic faith. And really that is the best legacy because even if our children leave God, they'll remember that we didn't right. and that they can always come back. Um, any particular obstacles or challenges that you had to overcome or continue to overcome to make that happen? Well, life is a long road to hold. Um, I think it is, it is. I, I, um, I don't know the other day I was thinking and I was like a lot of times, especially when you've been a Christian for a long time and you feel like you've gone through the Bible back and front and back and front and you know it, you could become pretentious. You could become cocky. You could become prideful. You could think mm -hmm. you've arrived. And mm -hmm. it's like, I was just humbled because it's like, Lord, you know what? We never arrive. We don't arrive on this earth. <laughs> and as long as I remember that, that I don't know it all, I don't have this Christian life thing figured out. You don't ever figure out faith. You keep doing it every day. It doesn't get, it, it, I, I guess to some it gets easier, but because there's, an experience, there's another new experience, it doesn't really get that easier because it's still the unknown. It's always you're grappling with the unknown. So you always have to trust God. Does it become easier to trust God? I can't answer that. But you know that this is what you do. Um, you, you lean on him. You just stay leaning on him. He just asks that we have this little bit of faith, this little tiny bit of faith, and he could do great things in us. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, that humbles me because it's like, I know I know the Bible, but I don't know nothing. <laughs> I don't know anything. Because I, you know what? God is in control. He is in control. I, I'm not. So um, that's an well, obstacle, just as obvious. It's almost like we, um, we grow up a little bit and then we're reminded in a, maybe a painful way that we're not so grown up after we're all. We're not so grown up after all. <laughs> and, and, and the other obstacle I would say is like, you know, I come from a strict West Indian household and my parents never apologized for anything, um, even if they were wrong. And there's spiritual implications there because I'm like, you know, if I'm wrong in front of my children, I need to be able to do that and let them know I was, I was wrong. Because how am I going to model God's love to them if I don't mm -hmm. right. show grace and show forgiveness and do all of those things? And so it was like, relearning some of the things that I had learned growing up like children made me realize that this is how God loves us I mean if I do some of the things that were done to me and I'm not saying my parents were awful but you know they they did, did things because that's what they did right I don't want to do that um just because that's what was done to me and and if there's a spiritual correlation there let me let me do something that appears radical and different if that's what's going to make a difference for me and for my children and so again foundation is scripture 
God speaks to me, tells me something, this is the way to do it, do it this way. Listen to what your child, listen to what your child is saying. Don't just go along with what you want to do. It might actually work. And so, you know. Um, what, how do you know that when God is speaking to you? I know that's a universal question for many believers. I don't know, because I'm not one of those people that says, you know, I know, I, I'm not, well, I don't, it's not part of my vernacular to walk around and say, well, God told me. I, I, I don't, that's not what happens. But sometimes for me, it is a thought, an idea that I know I didn't come up with on my own. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, totally. I've been, like I've been praying about something, like, like what should I do and whatever? Uh, uh, how do I approach this? And then out of the blue, it seems, it's like, because I've been thinking about it and praying about it. And it's like, this is the approach. This is what you need to do. Mm. And to me, that's only, that's not me. I mean, it's coming through me, mm-hmm. but it's not me. So that, that's when I noted, like, this is what I, this is what I should do. You know, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. I know. Um, I felt the Lord telling me something on Monday, pretty sure, because I was praying about it. And I got counsel from some friends. And then today I started having doubts about it. Again, and and I thought, that, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did I not hear God? C- can, I, can I say that uh, I felt um, deceived in any way? I thought, no, I have to really believe that God spoke to me. Not spoke out loud, but you know what I'm saying. That's that the other thing. That's the other thing. When, when I'm on a path and he's giving me something, then, then the doubts kind of come. Mm. And it's like, okay, now what am I, who am I going to listen to? Whose report am I going to believe? Mm the doubt or what I know to be what makes sense. And then I just put the doubt aside and now I'm saying it like this, just, but it's not a just thing. Mm-hmm. And I can, I continue on and mm-hmm. I have some degree of peace and calm and confidence and all the things that people would see and say, you're so sure of yourself. I have a little bit of that, but inside I'm quaking because I'm like, you know, I I'm think just- I- I think God likes it. Not that he, we um, are ang- anxious. I, I know that we don't please him when we're anxious because right. we're not trusting him. But I don't think he minds me quaking a little bit, like you mentioned, because it, it keeps me humble and dependent. What yeah, do you think? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I agree mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. yeah. And, and we get, it's like you just started speaking, and I don't think you were nervous but because you're a natural speaker, but you're going to get even more confident as you have more opportunities after this uh, sheltering at home is over. And yet each time I've been speaking 20 years, I still want to be so totally dependent on the Lord because that's who does the actual work in me, in me, through me and in the lives of my hearers. So even those who are listening today, you know, uh, Andrea and I have nothing particularly special to share other than we are pilgrims. uh, in a pilgrim way and we're just uh, leaning on god daily and i hope that's an encouragement to our listeners what do you think i i hope so too because Mm -hmm. i mean even now in light of the you know the pandemic and coronavirus i mean god is all we got (laughs) that's all we have Mm -hmm. um we're here everybody's trying to struggle and figure out what day is it and what are we doing next and what's new what's the new normal I, I don't have the answers to that. And it's like, you know, if I start listening to all the things that people say, I will be more anxious. I will be more confused because, and so I make a choice to just like, not to put my head in the sand, but to like focus on what he wants me to learn in this time period. And there's always something. And when I was walking the other day, I said, what if he is, what if I am being fortified right now? What if I'm being strengthened for the next challenge ahead? Mm. What if this is a preparation for something else? Um, what if being forced to do things differently, being forced to spend more time in his word, being forced to be still, being forced to being around the people that you know, what if it's preparation for something else? Why don't I treat it like that? Instead of, you know, a- a- acting like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. In my human sense, sometimes I get like, oh my goodness, I'm going crazy. What day it is? I go for a drive. But because I'm human. But th- 
the whole, like, Lord, what are you teaching me? And I came up with fortification. He's trying to strengthen me. He's trying to make me stronger, mold mm -hmm. me into something, mold me into his character. And so that's what I'm believing. And that's how I'm living, you know, during this time. Um, I think that's so great. I, I wrote something the other day about let's don't waste this time because once it's over, we're going to try to go back to normal and we'll stop listening to God perhaps quite so clearly because we've been frustrated. And maybe I've told you earlier, I felt a little listless at times like, oh, is there really anything worthwhile that I'm going to do today? And yeah, I thought, oh, let's pay attention to God even more. Like what you're saying, you're being fortified. Our faith is being fortified when we're forced to lean on him. And I think that's a beautiful way to, um, well, I'll close up this interview for one thing, but I want you to share the two books, one that you're uh, uh, almost completed with and then one that you wrote earlier. Could you just give the titles and what their topics are? Okay. Um, the first one. Jeez, I just drew a blank. Hold on. Your e-book your e that you offer on your website. I know, I know. Oh, my goodness. Oh, <laughs> age is taking over me. It's a, it's okay, I'm older than you are, so that's okay. We'll put it in show notes. You were just telling me about your newest one, and it's okay. Uh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Oh, okay. The first, the ebook. I wrote this book. <laughs> it was called My Best Marriage Advice. How oh to, yeah. How to thrive in your marriage, and it was inspired because at the time my daughter was getting married, and she said, and I quote, that she looks up to us mm -hmm. as um, marriage models, and I said to my husband Garth. She looks up to us. Does she know that we still argue? <laughs> but I said, I said, no, seriously, there must be something to this. We've, we're still here. We're still standing. Let me, because I make fun of it, you know, we're, yeah, of course. or whatever. Let me just take all the things that she has said to me and put them in this ebook about marriage. Because this year, this year is 31 years. I know mm -hmm. I look 30, but. Of course whatever. you do. <laughs> so this, so I wrote that book. And it was the first time I did it. And I actually wrote it because Sue encouraged me to write an ebook. She said, this should be an ebook. And I said, ebook, what's that? Okay. Me? I encouraged you? Yes, you did. You don't even remember. I don't remember that. Said, oh, I feel so good. I did yes, something. You said, you said, this should be an ebook. Because I was writing all of these blog posts about marriage. Uh -huh. You said, you should write an ebook about marriage. And I said, I kind of remember that now. And I said, I'm, I'm going to take some credit here. Yes. And I said, you should have seen me afterwards. I said, ebook. Hmm. What's that? What's that? Maybe I can write an ebook. And I Googled everything and I found out about Amazon and self publishing and all the other stuff. And I said, oh. And I said, okay, I did it. I did that ebook. But I'm like, I'm not a marriage writer. No. No, okay. I, don't, I, I don't want to write about, I mean. But the best, best testimonial is your daughter. So yes. that's better than any stranger because they've seen your marriage up close. She's like, we want, I was like, wow. So that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. And this book, the second book that I have been working on is called The Comfort of Night. I love that title. And hopefully it will be published by um, mid, in the summer, June, okay. July of 2020. Um, and when it comes out, I will be sure to let Sue know so that she can share with her, yeah. um, with her readers also. But um, Do you have any closing wisdom you want to share with our audience today? It's been uh, delightful to talk to you, by the way. I don't know. What closing wisdom do I have? Listen, I heard something this morning. Sometimes you're too big for God to use, but you're never too small for God to use. Oh, I love that. I heard that this morning. I was like, yeah, yes. You know what? Make yourself available. You never know. God has give, birthed you with gift and, gifts and talents. Some of them seem big. Some of them seem small, but none of them are inconsequential in the kingdom, especially if another person comes to know him because of what he's given to you. So just keep yourself available. Be open to whatever he's called you to do. Let him work in you. Let him work in you. Great. And if anybody would like to uh, contact Andre to speak at your MOPS group or any other group, you can see her contact information in our show notes. Thanks so much. You're delightful. Love you lots. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.